Come on, somebody out there must need some reason to help keep them awake, or even a couple of people would like to uh, type away. Fine. Or who oh, is that? Tim here, Glenn. Hi, Tim. I will do some minutes as long as someone um, assists as well, um, Tim Wysinski, just to make sure I don't miss anything. But I'll I'll be in the I'll be in the markdown world. How's okay. that? Okay. Do we have somebody else out there who can help out help with Tim? Mostly with names in case I miss them. Oh come on, somebody can help Tim out. I'm right, glad I'll help him. This is Chris. Oh, thank you, Chris. That was Christopher Wood. It's Chris. Yeah, I expect anybody who's going to present in the next two sessions, but I guess Chris beat me to it, so thank you. Well, make sure you put Chris and your name down there, there, Tim, so you're immortalized in the Markdown recording of this, <laughs> this session. That's one of and, the perks. Uh, Margaret also volunteered in chat to just help keep, you know, she did the line share at the minutes last time, but she'll keep an eye on things this time, too, so. Thank you, Barbara. Well, Barbara's also been doing all the, the so much of the minute taking for the nomcom. Um, her fingers must be tired. We have oh, so many meetings. <laughs> Dare we say if we were the ITU, we would hire people to do this for us. So. Oh, uh, uh, well, it's a couple minutes after. So while we're getting booted up, I will say that I will just uh, keep an eye on Jabber for a mic line. If you have comments that you want to bring to the mic, but for some reason can't audio yourself, I will be happy to present them. So we do have one report I see in the chat. Um, oh, Meet Echo picked it up. They're, they're checking the MP3 audio stream. Yeah, Meet Echo is already looking at it. So. Thank you, Meet Echo. It's very comforting to know you're there. And <laughs> it's very comforting. Now, so we're good. Okay. And Martin, I'm guessing you're in your usual uh, local mute mode. So we'll take that as uh, recognized. All right. Well, uh, shall we get started then? We have Please scribes. Start. We have everything working. So awesome. So welcome to session two of the ADD working group at ITF 109. Uh, I'd like to oh, let me scroll here. Like all ITF sessions, this session, of course, is covered by the ITF note well. Please familiarize yourself with it if you have not by now. If you haven't by this week, if you haven't been paying attention. <laughs> um, so for tonight's session, we don't have any presentations, but we have a continuation discussion of discussion. Uh, we had a very lively discussion going on on the Monday session or um, session one of this week around uh, the concept of equivalent resolvers. Uh, for those who missed it, if you want to uh, just take, jump over into the um, the note uh, etherpad section, you'll see at the very top of that the uh, transcription of the uh, session uh, from Monday. A lot of very good conversation. Unfortunately, we had to cut it off because we ran out of time. So tonight, we're going to keep that up. Uh, time permitting, uh, when that discussion sort of gets to a, a good place, um, we're going to then have a second topic, which is uh, IP address is in certificates. This is something that's come up a few times on the list and other discussions, and it seemed like a good opportunity to uh, have a chat about it. So that's the proposed agenda. Any any agenda bashing people like to put up? Uh, um, Martin, go ahead. So I'm, I'm curious, that. Glenn, what uh, what you think the discussion on IP addresses and certificates is likely to do? Is there any confusion over what's going on here? 
Well, I've seen a few postings on the list, and I've seen a few um, items raised in uh, the in the um, uh, GitHub uh, issues uh, on some of the drafts. So it seemed like some people wanted to have a discussion about it and, and whether it would work, whether it's something practical. I've also seen uh, postings that the certificates issued from um, Let's Encrypt, uh, supposedly. And I have not verified this, but I've seen comments saying that Let's Encrypt certificates currently do not support this. And so I thought this would be a, a reasonable discussion for us to have um, and try to sort some of that out. Okay. Does that make sense, Mark? So, but yeah, let's let's get to the facts later then. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we may, we, may not, we we may not even get to it. So, so we may have some so much great discussion about equivalent resolvers uh, that we may not and, get, and there. get to it, and it might be a very short discussion. <laughs> we have to, well, as time wise, we do have two hours, but we don't have to use it all, folks. So if we get to a good place, uh, we, we can wrap it up and people can go to bed. So with that said, uh, let us pick up the conversation uh, where we left it off. Uh, the last person um, uh, back on Monday, we had a, a very healthy conversation going on between uh, uh, Ben and Martin. Actually, Mike Bishop was in there. Uh, so there's lots of people had a lot of things to say about uh, equivalent resolvers. So. Uh, do you need me to put the, the definition back up that we had up there last time uh, to trigger people's memories? Or can we, or do people remember the conversation? Well, we're off to a slow start, so I think that might be a good idea, Glenn. Let me pull it up here. Give me one second. I think people are tired out with this being Friday. <laughs> it's been a long week. And Finder is spinning. OK, can everyone see that? This is the definition uh, as taken uh, from from what was included in draft box ADD requirements, and which um, uh, the Tommy Polly uh, Deer draft uh, built upon, and this is what we were discussing last time: the notion that uh, how do we uh, make the assertion that uh, the upgraded resolver uh, is equivalent to the uh, previous resolver um, that was unencrypted uh, DNS over port fifty three. Uh, and once you do the upgrade, how do you tell if they're the same or the equivalent resolver? Eric, please. Uh, Eric Worth, that is. Standard question. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, so. Here, I just start off immediately with the comment I was going to make at the end of last time that I ended up making in the on the list, but not everyone reads the list, of course. But I think from the perspective of a client trying to protect our users, we have sort of two big categories of what we're looking for and what we want to get out of it is these sort of equivalence concepts. One is that if things are working well for our users, we want it to keep working well. So this is kind of closest to what the definition of equivalence here is. That is that if there are any names that they were able to get, they have to be able to get those names before. If there's any filtering that was going on, they have to keep getting that as well after any upgrade. So it's not quite necessary. It needs to be perfect equivalence, things that could be caching differences that no user can care about that. But everything that was working just has to keep working from the good enough for the user's perspective. And this also includes things like the latency has to be good enough. So that's the first category that's important. The second category that's important that I think this definition is completely missing, which was also kind of brought up a bit last time, is the privacy perspective. Users, they may have chosen the config that existed before, so they may have explicitly put their trust in these resol this resolver they had before. So changing away from that could be a violation of the user's expectations of trust. Um, there, there's room for things in here, like either making sure it's the same exact party running it, so it's the same entity with the user's trust in it, or maybe something more like the Firefox model of they are only doing upgrades to embedded servers that are known to have good privacy, so it's believed to be equivalent trust for the user's need. But there has to be something in here for the trust and privacy, because 
just as was pointed out last time, just being the same results is not necessarily good enough if it's we've switched over to, to a resolver, the user is not trusted at all. And in general, the only way I know to get that is same provider, same running entity type guarantees. And the first category, this thing keep working out good enough, you kind of assume that they're going to want to make that happen if we've at least vetted that we're doing an upgrade to the same provider. OK, that's all I've got. Great. Thank you, Eric. Ecker? Um, yeah, I mean, so I think I, I agree. Uh, not surprisingly, I agree with much of what Eric Roth just said. Um, um, I think that uh, from my perspective, there are um, there there are two um, that, that equivalence has to have uh, two properties. Um, one property is the one that is hand waved around here, which is the uh, the, the 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 results, um, which I'll talk about in a second. And the other is um, the property that um, that you're actually connecting to them and not to some other third party. Um, so, um, you know, uh, in particular, um, if I stand up a proxy that sits in front of the true, the true Joe resolver and, um, and then forwards all the, all the queries of the true Joe resolver, but also publishes them on Twitter, that is not equivalent resolver, even though it gives the same answers. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I, I suggested some text, um, in, uh, in, in email about this and Martin also had some about how, um, you know, this is as if you securely delivered the data, the true resolver. So I think that part is actually pretty easy, straightforward, and easy to easy to talk about. Um, and you know, matches conventional definitions of security and privacy. Um, I think that the, the thing that is um, described here is much more problematic, frankly, um, namely that the, the civil responses. So um, you know, to give an example, um, supposing that um, the, as Eric says, the cache behavior is different, or perhaps. Um, you know, uh, because it's a different location, um, you get somewhat different, you get subtly different responses in terms of load, in, ter in terms of like the address of the uh, of the far server because someone else is using geographic load balancing, something like that. So the question, question of, how, of how to describe those responses being similar, I think, is very difficult. And I, I think it may be simple. I think I think that it may actually be easier to talk about authorization um, and delegation from the original resolver than it is to talk about the sort of mechanical equivalency of the data. Um, uh, finally, um, this, as, as I mentioned, email. Um, this last uh, second half of the slide is like totally inadequate um, because um, it's describing how to actually do this, and there are other ways to do it. So um, I think that, whole, that that last section simply be struck entirely. Uh, thank you, Ecker. Ben Schwartz, please. Uh, so I think I'm also repeating something I said on the mailing list. But uh, my my conclusion after thinking about this for a little bit is that we are we are trying to say two different things. We are we are here um, trying to say both what we are asking a resolver to do in order to be considered equivalent, and we are discussing what the client can um what the client can do in order to identify and verify a um a, that are an equivalent resolver and those are not the same thing there are a bunch of properties like privacy policies that we are asking equivalent resolvers to provide that are not observable but there are some observable properties that we do have and we we do want clients to be able to verify. Um, and I think that the observable properties that we want clients to verify are something like, uh, we want clients to verify that A has operational control over the selection of B, and B is in fact the entity described by A. Um, thank you, Ben. Ecker? I was in the queue earlier. Um, so I think you know, often it's useful to test one's definitions against hypotheticals. So let me give you a hypothetical, um, which is supposing that I am a ISP and I operate a Doe resolver. And I'm uh, sorry, I operate a, a Doe 53 resolver. And I'm just like really too lazy to operate my own Doe resolver. And so I would like to forward all the Doe requests. To, I, like to serve, I like to continue to serve the Doe 53, but I like to forward all the Doe requests to 1.1.1.1. Is that an equivalent resolver? Mr. Dean. So not wearing any hat. <laughs> I'm going to turn my video on. 
so not wearing any hat here. Um, you know, as we work through this, the 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 reason we've had this discussion is uh, I think twofold. One, uh, there is a, a requirement, or in the requirements document, there was this basis of trying to identify what is the end goal here, right? And the and the first proposal is well, let's get the upgrade to be uh, equivalent to the current behavior of of what you're connected to right now. That's one goal. But there's this other piece of things that I think we should consider. That is that. You know, part of the mission of ADD is is twofold, right? One is to do the discovery of what's available uh, or what's possible, and the second part is to convey back into the client through some means uh, information that the client will use to make a decision of is this a server a resolver they want to choose. And I think maybe that splits what this equivalence discussion is about in two different ways. One sort of a behavioral thing conceptually of what's the goal of the upgrade. But the second one is, you know, capturing in requirements what information we're going to uh, transfer to the client for the client ultimately to make a decision. Now, how that client makes that decision is out of scope for our current charter, but the conveyance of the information is in scope. Thank you, Glenn. Ralph Weber, please. Okay, um, so I, I feel I, we've gone full circle because I recall that initial uh, discussions we said that pretty much, okay, an equivalent resolver is done by the same entity. And then people said, well, that's not specific enough, which, and then we come up with this claim, which might be more specific, but of course uh, re requires you to, to run on, on the same entity. So wouldn't the same entity thing just be a simple, Thing that granted doesn't cover the use case where the uh, ISP is too too dumb, but most of these ISPs already do do that with their DOE 53 resolvers also. Uh, thank you, Ralph. Ben. So uh, this is uh, on Ecker's line of, of thinking. Um, yeah, I think that we've we've been abusing the term equivalent here, and I think it's generating confusing uh, confusion. Instead of equivalent encrypted resolver, I would prefer to be talking about a designated a designated encrypted resolver. So the the thing that we should be trying to verify here is did A truly designate B as its encrypted resolver? Thank you, uh, Joey. And just uh, for the notes, this is Joey Salazar pointing that out because you don't not a a commonly. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. So Joey Salazar from Article Nineteen. Um, so then, basically, we have like uh, equivalency through same entity, and then equivalency through same resolution answers. Um, so then there's also the verification for that equivalency. I think that for the current goal of narrowing down the requirements scope uh, for the for the growth group, I think that focusing on the equivalency and verification of the same entity resolution makes sense. Uh, it does seem a little bit straightforward. I mean, definitely simpler than considering the other the other use cases or or, or the other scenarios right now. Uh, so then, like. I think maybe after after we get a head start on that, uh, then we can start focusing on the on the other equivalencies and the designated resolvers that definitely have a lot more considerations on 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 keeping up with expectations and user user consent and all those things. Yeah. Thank you, Joey. Martin Thompson. So I think Eka's example really highlighted it for me, and I was I was already uncomfortable with the notion of equivalency and. I'm agreeing with Ben here that we need to throw that concept out. I actually like the two things that you have on the bottom of the slide, at least in the abstract. Um, I don't know that they can be turned into something um, more concrete, but in, in a lot of cases, what's what's happening here is that people are connecting to networks and, and adopting the posture that whatever the network tells me to do with my DNS queries, I will do. And uh, under those constraints, then you can imagine that the DEA draft work, the mechanisms in the DEA draft would work perfectly well. And um, 
if you then look at some of the things that we've talked about in, I think now four or five different drafts about using DHCP and RA, the, um, those mechanisms would, would work equally well also. And so the idea that that is equivalent or maybe even uh, no worse than or better than in some ways, all of those questions uh, don't become relevant unless we have um, some questions about the differing privacy policies, for instance, that might be applicable here. And I think that's, there's a really simple way to deal with that, which is to say that the expectations that you have uh, with respect to the privacy treatment of your queries uh, over the current resolver should be roughly the same for whichever random one you're getting assigned to. Obviously, you're in a, um, uh, the resurrecting duckling state in this case, and you're going to trust the first thing that you get given. So uh, you're going to get what you're going to get. Uh, thank you, Martin. Andrew. Uh, yeah. Um, just sort of reflecting on this um, and disagreeing with the idea of not having the word e equivalent, um, I th uh, if, if, at least for one particular context, because uh, as I see it, uh, equivalent is really important for uh, same provider auto upgrade, um, because in that context um i think the justification for doing that uh or the rationale it is you you can you can do that because there are no surprises to the user because uh, nothing fundamentally has changed so that's quite a reasonable thing to do as soon as you you, you do that um without being equivalent so uh, to, to the point that uh, uh, i think echo made about it being uh, designated for example um uh, the, then potentially from a user's point of view their data is now accessible to a a different third party to the one that that they were previously dealing with and and um, dare I say it, for those of us thinking about things like GDPR, that's, that's potentially problematic if that happens without their permission. Um, so I think equivalence matters for some context. It's, I'm not saying it ne is necessary in every case, but I, I, th I think there are, it is important to have a clear definition of equivalence, and that has to include both it being the same party and the same results as far as you're able to ascertain them. Um, there, there are clearly other things you might choose to do, but they're, they're not equivalent uh, and they may need some sort of user permission first. So I think we need this and, uh, um, and I think we need to, 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 to bash out what the definition is. That's my point. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Daniel. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So, um, so to me, what I, I'm hearing about um, with authorized um, resolvers or equivalent resolvers is um, basically a resolver that is being run by the same entities that um, is running the initial one we got, uh, we received. Um, but from yes, I mean yesterday or um, the previous meeting, I had the impression that um, some bunch of people were believing that um, it should not be, it was pretty much too much restrictive. And um, so I was, uh, I would like to clarify um, what scenario um, these people have, which means, which I understand, and maybe I'm wrong, um, that we can have a, an authorized resolver that is being actually run by another entity than the the, the primary one um, so so that's one point um, the other one is um, we usually think um, think in term of a single authorized resolver and to me I envision uh, um, that there can be multiple uh, resolvers that are being authorized um, the, for example, I, I'm, I envision that it can run DNS of a TLS or though, I mean, that could be two things um, that are being authorized by um, by the initial resolver, um, I mean, uh, 
the, the one one doing do 53 for example and um, um, yeah so it seems to me that the what we we should look at is how we can discover this list of authorized resolver and the the most likely the the input the more common input we're going to receive is an IP address and I think it's a little bit different from um, being able to say okay I'm connecting to one resolver oh yes he's authorized but I'm not having the complete picture of all the resolvers that are being authorized by the initial entity Is that it, Daniel? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ted. Thank you. Uh, so, <clears throat> so I think there are a couple of different things going on here. And watching the chat, I think uh, people are, are rapidly coming to the conclusion that equivalence isn't a rich enough concept for, for what people are talking about here. And I think one thing we probably need to tease out pretty quickly is the difference between access to the same pool of names and the same behavior with the query stream data. Um, because I think some of what this starts out with when it's talking about the same upper layer DNS functionality, it's actually saying, hey, I am a resolver, let's say, in, inside your corporate um, firewall, and I can tell you about another resolver that has access to the same pool of names. That is, its view of split DNS is the same as mine. It might be might be that the only time you can do that is when they are run by the same service provider on two different IP address uh, and port. but it's, it's a useful thing to tell people that's about not the equivalence of the query stream data handling, but about the, the data to which these two things have access. And the, the question Ecker asked so long ago about if, if your ISP wants to point you to, to uh, Quad9 for, for Doe is actually kind of a, a case of this. If what your ISP was doing before was just talking to authoritatives and giving you stuff out of its cache. It's basically saying, I don't have access to any names that aren't in the public DNS. Those people have access to the public DNS. You can consider them uh, kind of from the pool of data that they're drawing from to give you the, the information to be the same. That's completely different from the privacy uh, aspects. Uh, it doesn't tell you anything about one of them posts to Twitter and the other one posts to your internal IT logs. Um, and I think we, we, we still need this information about um, the pools of names you have access to aspect of this equivalence. Um, and so I think when, when we're looking at this and talking about recommended, we may want to distinguish between a statement that the other people have access to the same names I do and a statement that I, for whatever belie reason, believe that their privacy practices are as good or better than mine. And I, I frankly think the second one is much, much harder uh, to, to manage unless it's, it's functionally a delegation or an authorization relationship where you, you have a business relationship with the client and you have delegated this to somebody else who is obeying your rules. But I, I, I do kind of increasingly come to the conclusion that we need two statements here, um, whichever way we, we want to describe them as recommendation or equivalence or something else. Thanks. Thank you, Ted. Ecker. Yeah, so I, I was trying to take a step back and ask what we're trying to accomplish here. So, I mean, this is a requirements document. It's not um, it's not a protocol document. Um, and so the point of this the point of this um, text is to scope what the properties of the protocol we are designing um, has to have. And so like, how do we actually get here? Well, the point of this isn't this that policy set mechanism. And so the, um, and so the, and, and so it's just defining the parameters again, a mechanism for designing. So like if a local configuration were actually secure, like if you magically got, could magically get every DHCP, like, or whatever information about the, um, you know, uh, um, the, 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 the dot, dot resolver that the ISP, wanted, the network wanted you to use, then we could actually just like ignore like then we could ignore this theoretical equivalent because all we care about is like recommended or designated or whatever. And in fact, I mean, this is like effectively how SPAU and 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 some of that Firefox steering work, which is to say that you know, we have externalized information um, that we use and we use the local network's information to look up table. Um, so um, 
and so, but so, so the data which we have to talk about, um, so, so, I, so, I mean, like the, the the functional property is designated. The functional property is I would like the network to tell me which encryption resolver it wants me to use, and then the the security properties um, are actually about um, limiting um, the uh, attacks under um, under the actual threat model we're in, which is where the network is like not actually super secure. And so, if you look at um, and and so if you look at the material there about like um, you know. Uh, um, the, the, in, in D or about like the, about the IP addresses the same and that kind of stuff, right? So I think that the the question for equivalent or operator or whatever the restriction here is what properties that you think the the designated resolver has to have in order to participate in this system, right? And so, like one design would be you say, look, there is anything the local network tells me, like um, you know, I don't like they they can like they can like not cooperate with the designated resolver at all, right? And um, and as I say, that's like actually kind of what happens with like um, SPAU and um, uh, uh, and Firefox um, steering. Um, and the other is the one that's in Deer, which is they have to cooperate at least to the extent to which um, you know that the uh, um, the designated resolver has to play ball because it has to point back to the original resolver. But that's for security reasons. It's not for like it's not for, it's not for mechanism reasons. And so um, as I said, so I think like the um, I, I think we have basically jettison all this text <laughs> um, and, and merely to talk about like designation, which is the relevant point, and then later talk and then somewhere separately talk about the points that are already in this document about not being able to steer you to somewhere else that you otherwise wouldn't be sending data to. And that's how we get into this, the concept that the designated resolver has to play ball for this whole thing to work. But if we invented some way that didn't need that, then we could, then we wouldn't have to do that. So I think that the idea of it being self-operated. Or uh, or um, are affiliated with it anyway, like it is, is like not a necessary part of this. Um, and and as I say, you know, really nothing can stop um, people doing that. Um, like you know, if I want if I wanted to do a deal like on my local network with 888 to be like a deer resolver, and they're willing to serve like this this, this the deer equivalent IP certificate, like no one can stop me from doing that. Um, whatever mechanism we design. So um, I guess I don't think trying to like pre prevent that in this, in this in this is a helpful. The purpose of this is again is the scope we're trying to accomplish, and what we're trying to accomplish is here's a pointer over here. Thank you, Eric. I was in the middle of typing a message to chat myself, uh, Ben Schwartz. Hey, so I think that the concept of equivalence is useful. I just don't think it's the thing that we should be trying to prove in the protocol. So I think we want both of these concepts. Uh, I think that the, the, our purpose here um, is to enable the discovery of resolvers, and we would like those resolvers to be equivalent. So it, it's fine to have this as sort of motivational text. Uh, I just don't think that the requirement should be that we prove equivalence because we can't prove equivalence. Uh, what we can and maybe should do is have text in whatever protocol we eventually develop that says something like the designated encrypted resolver should be equivalent, you know, normative should, and refer to this to, to some consensus definition of equivalence here. And I think that definition of equivalence needs to include both observable potentially observable behavior, like the responses and these unobservable characteristics, like privacy policy. Thank you, Ben. Eric. Did I? Oh, there we go. So I think the fact that we have so much discussion over what's good enough and what things we need to prove is pretty solid proof that this different parties want different things here, and this is squarely in the policy area of things. But I think it's still good to have definitions so we can get things on the same page. So I think what we need is just stop trying to focus on getting one thing we can prove or talk about or care about. We just need multiple different definitions of different concepts. We need things like a network designated resolver is one that meets these things of the network is designated and doesn't necessarily say anything else. Uh, Resolver designated resolver is a resolver said I want you to use this. It doesn't necessarily say anything else. An equivalent resolver is one that has similar results, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't necessarily say anything else. A same party resolver is one that's run by the same entity and such. And so I think we just need solid definitions of all these things and come up with ways that we can technically signal or prove any of these concepts that can be technically proven or solved. And then it's just up to the clients what level it wants to 
check for before it does an upgrade what level it wants to require. And as long as we have all the mechanisms for any of these things that can be proved to be proved and for any of them to try to say we're meeting these things and follow those proofs and that's clients can go from there and decide what they want to do because what levels things they want to require that is policy and that is out of scope. Thank you, Eric. Lars. I am not quite friends with Miteco. Um, I think that the gist of what I want to say was just said. Uh, the decision about equivalence sits with the client, not with the on the server side, which means that um, the server cannot declare equivalence. So uh, the, the I think we're using the wrong term here. We should talk about alternate uh, alternate uh, resolver service. And uh, it's then up to the client to decide whether that's acceptable or not. So uh, what what we should look at is a given <clears throat> set of circumstances uh, in which the client is operating, uh, it will or will not accept the, the suggestion of a resolver. And uh, if things change or if there, if there are alternatives, uh, it, it can make a decision. And uh, we should focus on providing information to the clients so that it can make a decision about an alternative resolver. Uh, and it's not up to the uh, up to the, the the resolver to declare equivalent equivalence, nor is it is it up to the ACP or, or RA. Uh, so we should focus on the concept of alternative resolvers. Um, and if you look at it that way, the 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 the, the, the picture shifts somewhat. Uh, and you can start to to look at uh, the the various bits and pieces that you can provide, uh, bits and pieces of information that you can provide to the client, so that it has a decent chance to make a decision about whether it wants to trust and use a resolver or not. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. Kirsty P. Hi. Um. Yeah. Thanks. I'd just like to um say this. This discussion is really good um, to hear you talking about this. I want to go back to Ted's point about split DNS, which I think is quite useful to help framing in framing what I would think of equivalence. Um, so I'm just wondering if it might be helpful rather than trying to create definition to think about the use cases we'd like to account for. Like if I if I do have split DNS operating in my enterprise, I obviously don't want my internal private network like leaked to some resolver I don't expect. And I think um, that's like quite a helpful use case for me in terms of what equivalence means in that in that situation. Like um, other people have spoken about wanting the same results and not getting their worldview kind of changed on some change of resolver. There's been a lot of jabber chat um, about if you have a sketchy resolver, like how that's different for you as well. So it might be helpful to think about the use cases we'd like to account for and then think about the definition that gets us there, like whether you call it equivalence or designation or whatever. Um, I think that for me, that's a helpful way of thinking about it at least. Um, and I'd just like to say there is a lot of Jabber chat that I think could be quite helpful if it was like actually said um, for people watching the recording. Um, and I totally agree with some of the comments about separating the technical mechanism for recommendation and then separating that from the best practice under which conditions you'd like recommend a certain resolver. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Wes Hardiker, please. So great match to Lehman, who uh, teed me up perfectly, so I don't have to speak as long as I was planning on it, because he said half of what I was planning, and which really amounts to how do clients pick between the choices. So um, as, as Lehman said, you know, network identified and resolver identified are not helpful to the client if they can't verify the results. So it's great that it sounds like, you know, we may be coming up with a list of checkboxes that, you know, can define equivalence. That's fantastic. But we really not need that list to include markings that indicate which ones clients can actually verify. And unfortunately, that may be you know, low. But we already have uh, uh, the applications out in the wild that actually do things like check to see how resolvers behave so they can make decisions based on them. The uh, Chromium send three random strings feature is one of them, as is the DNSSEC roadblock RFC and DNSSEC trigger. Are, are ways that they're actually trying to go out and find. We, we need to uh, find you know resolvers that support their environment, and we need the equivalent on this side too. So you know how do resolvers actually do that? Thank you, Wes. Glenn. No hat, I presume.
Can't hear you, Glenn. Got Can your you video. Me? Now we got you. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to put this all back in context for everybody. So if you, you know, I think the this proposal may have gains and legs uh, beyond people understand the original context. So the original context is, if you go look at the the uh, draft box ADD requirements, uh, that uh, zero one version, which is the version that Chris is currently published and his co-authors have published, is a narrowed use case. Uh, not covering everything, it's covering a narrow set of use cases, which is what was uh, decided uh, was people wanted to work on initially going back to the interim. And so I don't think in the context of that draft, this is being proposed as this is a, a necessary requirement for all upgrades, but that for the use case described in that draft, this is a concept that that uh, is fundamentally based upon and built upon for that particular use case. And so th that would then put this to me, and I, I'll encourage people to think of it this way, as this is a piece of information that would be somehow discovered, conveyed to the client uh, as part of solving the requirements in that one particular use case. There are likely other use cases, split DNS being brought up is a very good example, where there will be other requirements, and this one might not even fact be on the table as a requirement uh, as written and would need to be updated and changed to fit into the other set of use cases um, that the group can consider along the way. So I hope that sort of frames it, at least as I'm hearing people talk about it uh, here and both on the list. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, Martin Thompson. So. I really liked Ben's proposal here. I've typed something into the chat that I think we are starting to coalesce around. I'm, I'm hearing this from a number of people. And that proposal is essentially that we enable a delegation either from the network or, or a resolver. Uh, that delegation has properties that are not significantly worse or no, no worse than the um, uh, authentication properties that you get from talking to it. The, uh, DO53 server that you are talking talking to uh, anyway. And in addition to providing that delegation, we would further recommend, with the usual caveats around recommendations and protocol police, um, that um, in addition to providing the encrypted transport, the resolver that is delegated has similar or better characteristics when it comes to a range of criteria. And I, I listed performance, privacy, and access to names, but there may be some other things that we might want to want to add to that list as well. Thank you, Martin. Harold. Thank you, Harold Alistair. Uh, the word equivalence is not an observable property of a protocol. So when describing the protocol, it needs to go. Uh, we have, what we are trying to do is an assertion that uh, if, you, if you're currently using Resolver A, you should consider using Resolver B. And uh, we can do a BCP-like recommendation that you should only make that assertion under, under certain circumstances, like uh, the names are right and, uh, and the privacy is OK. But uh, the word uh, equivalence is misleading and should be entirely removed. These are recommendations uh, that, sh and we can make, re make recommendations for when you should make recommendations, but we cannot test and cannot enforce and cannot provide equivalence. Thank you, Harold. Puneet. Oh, did I somehow? I'm sorry. I see the queue order right now. Um, well, I'm sorry, Eric, if I just skipped right over you. I'm not sure what happened there. Puneet, please go on. And um, my apologies, Eric. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK. So I was just. I think based on the discussion, there's, uh, I was going to propose 
some terms which may be help distinguish the different kinds of equivalence. One is obviously the resolution equivalence, which we are talking about. Then the other one is possibly operator equivalence and then the policy equivalence. Policy equivalence is probably the most vague out of these three. Uh, it could cover a lot of things, but I think if we use these terms, it may um, make the discussion easier to follow. That's it. Okay, thank you. Eric Worth? I just want to push back a little bit on any uh, sentiment that maybe we should just focus on designation alone and leave everything else up to just saying, hey, you should be good about this while you're doing designation. That's all you should rely on. Um, if, if that's all we have, I think there's going to be a lot of clients that will just not support this and then we're not going to get a lot of traction out of these protocols because a lot of clients feel that they have security or operational needs to have more than just an untrusted designation. So maybe if not everyone might, not all clients might require these things, but if we don't have any mechanisms at all to prove any level of same party or some equivalence of some sort, well then I don't think we're gonna get much traction with this protocol. So maybe that'd be good short term to see it's something out there, but we're gonna need to keep working on getting more in there if we want good adoption amongst clients. Thank you, Eric. Andrew. Yeah, um, I just wanted to jump in. There was some discussion in the chat, well, and also some of the people have asserted that uh, the entity operating the resolver doesn't matter. Um, so I just wanted to say verbally what Vittorio has put in the chat, which is actually, in my view, um, the entity operating the uh, resolver absolutely matters as well. Um, the, uh, if you change the entity, then certainly in some cases, you're going to have to ask the user. That's not something the client can do um, invisibly in the background um, without causing difficulties for the uh, for, for, for the entity that, that's running the client. Um, um, so I, I think for, for this particular use case, there are other use cases where it wouldn't matter, but for this use case, I think it, it, it's important uh, to include the entity operating the resolver as part of the equivalence uh, definition. Thanks. Thank you. Martin. So I wanted to uh, disagree with both Eric and Andrew separately. Um, Eric suggested that um, we might care about who operates the resolver, and of course we do. And Andrew said the same thing. But um, we're specifically talking here about the, uh, a scenario where there is no express preference about where your DNS queries go, because no effort has been made to do anything other than accept what the network has been, been telling you. If you adopt the policy that you do care about where your queries go, as Mozilla has, and I believe Chrome has, and a number of other people have suggested, Andrew said that, very much cares that it, it continues to go to the same entity. Um, when you care about that, you, you're going to need to take additional steps. But I think we have a possibility here of addressing some sizable portion of the use cases that we've identified by accepting this definition. And then for those people who have those additional requirements, we can talk about having things in addition to this that provide assertion of identities and, and various other things. So. Mozilla might use their trusted recursive resolver list to decide whether or not to follow this designation. Thank you, Martin. Liman. You're muted. Can someone explain why I have to authorize the audio every time I turn my mic on? And yeah, no, here you are. Uh, I never liked. Um, so uh, I think Martin might be slightly off track here uh, because if you have the two scenarios that either the, the client uh, doesn't really have an opinion on where it sends its queries, we, we don't have to declare equivalence because the client doesn't care. So it doesn't matter where the queries go. Uh, the only thing you might be interested in there is to avoid someone to inject rogue information about uh, uh, about uh, uh, resolvers 
so that you actually do care to the level that I want to use whatever is handed to me by the ACP or RA or some equivalent mechanism. Uh, but uh, I don't want anyone else on the network to be able to, to you know, uh, redirect my queries to a server that uh, that's not operated in the network or by the network environment that I'm working in. That that could that could be useful, but. Uh, I keep uh, thinking that the, what, what, what we're talking about here is not equivalence, it's whether it's acceptable to the client or not. They don't have to be equivalent, they need to still remain within the, the decision uh, bubble, the, the decision, uh, the set of, uh, set of properties of the resolver that is acceptable to the client. So please focus on that, is my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Ecker. I, I largely agree with MT here. Um, I mean, I think um, it's important to remember that the uh, you know the uh, you know, DO aside or dot aside, like the network can like steer you to any resolver it places any time it wants just by sending you stuff in DHCP, right? So um, you know the only part, like it can steer you to any DO fifty three resolver it wants. It just can't steer you to any DO dot or DO resolver it wants because no way of saying that. <laughs> so like. Um, you know, so having like having like generic restrictor requirements for like what kind of entity the network can steer you to for DO and DOT versus um, you know DO fifty three doesn't make any sense really. Um, now um, I think that there's the, 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 I do want to say there's plenty of good material in in like the, in, in this document that your document about like not having um, and that'll make the situation worse in terms of like persistently steering in the wrong place or those kinds of things. I think that that's that's good material. Um, um, but um, I think to the extent to which one does care about the entity which is operating it, um, as with the TRR, um, then I think, as Martin says, you need to answer for information. So I mean, if you think about the way that 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 that, that, um, that Firefox's those string works, right? Is Firefox has a resolver that it likes, and what it's willing to be told by the network is, here are some other resolver which you also like, which you should use instead of the resolver you would use by default that you like, and. Uh, and as an that's the case, we do care the entity. Um, we don't care. We don't so much care about equivalence um, because, like, actually, it isn't necessarily equivalent. Um, what we care about is, is is an opinion. So we might want, um, you know, some sort of like. Uh, uh, um, and so in this circumstance, you can imagine, as Martin says, we could just look up at the TRR list, which is what you do now. Um, but you might want the protocol to be. In terms of, once again, we're trying to find requirements. We want the requirements to say, well, here's some way like bolt on some sort of like meta information that gets gets attached to this as well that you might use in a way, way. But in terms of like the in terms of the, in terms of like the set of requirements besides that, it's just like just tell me where the thing is, and then allow me to verify that it's where it's supposed to be. Which is what Deer does, by the way. I think like you know, I think if you just reverse it here and say what is Deer doing, like Deer is doing effectively the right thing. Um, you know, modulo perhaps. Um, as I say, perhaps some questions about whether or not it um is going to actually work with them um, through the right set network elements. But if you ask what Deer does, it's doing what we expect it to do. I think regardless of what, what the requirements actually say. Thank you, Ecker. Ben, please. Hey, uh, Ben Schwartz. I've heard a couple of comments related to what I would call a non-delegation rule. This idea that there might be at least some circumstances where you want to require that the DNS traffic not be steered to a different entity. And I just want to say uh, non-delegation is uh, is not an option. We do not have the option to enforce a non-delegation rule because to a DNS client, a DNS forwarder is indistinguishable from an iterative resolver. So while we might have rules about non-delegation uh, and those rules might have to be enforced in some manner, enforcing them cannot sensibly be the, the client's job because the existence or non-existence of delegation is not visible to the client in any reliable fashion. Thank you, Ben. Vittorio, please. Uh, well, I, I just wanted to, to say that, I mean, to be productive, I, I think we have to keep the parts of the story really separate. And there are at least three different parts to this story. So there is a initially a policy decision decision by the operator of resolver A on the fact that uh, the resolver B that they want to recommend is equivalent. So that, that's one concept of equivalence. Then there's a, a technical mechanism, a protocol through which op the operator of resolver A tells the client that they think that B is equivalent. 
And finally, there is a policy decision in the client on whether to accept the recommendation or, or what to check and under which conditions. So I, I think we, in this discussion, we end up I mean, messing up and merging the, the three parts of the story, and this is not very productive. I, I think we should rather focus on the technical mechanism, which should basically authenticate the fact that the recommendation is coming from the operator resolver A to the extent possible, maybe with different degrees of certainty, and this is a part of the policy then for the client. That, uh, and and then allow the client to get the, the information they need to make the policy decision on their side on whether to accept the, the recommendation, we, which is, I mean, I guess something we have to gather from the client developers on what kind of information they, they actually need. And then, I mean, the, the policy parts of the story, I think we can at most make recommendations on best practices if, if we want to venture into that. But, uh, I mean, th there will always be decisions that are taken by each individual operator and client and we cannot control them. So that this is not something we, we can solve. At, at most, we could make recommendations. And uh, in general, also, I mean, the, the, the policy side of the story is also already addressed at other layers because in the end, I mean, whether the, the operator resolver A can add one more entity into the loop because now they want to delegate the encrypt resolver to some, someone else is already regulated in most cases by privacy laws. So there, there are already constraints to when and how they, they can do it. So, I mean, I, I don't think it's something we have to solve directly. So, I mean, I, I also agree with the fact that in theory that there should be no more new parties in the, into the loop. So, I mean, this is something we can recommend. But I, 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 re I really think we have to focus on, on the technical mechanism to convey the recommendation. And, and then the rest is, I think, not, not really something that, I mean, or something we can address separately, but not, not at the same time. Thank you, Vittorio. Tommy Jensen, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. So part of the, I think part of the hangups I was having listening to this can be identified simply by resolver identified for me needing to be split. Um, as some have identified, uh, some clients simply are connecting to a server to get DNS and they have no opinions. In that scenario, um, as Ecker said, uh, there's reasons a network operator may want to offload encrypted traffic, fine. The client doesn't care, just give me the address. It's encrypted, it's better, I'm happy. But there are cases where I am using DHCP or I only have an IP address for other reasons, but I have a strong desire to make sure that I'm communicating with basically that same server in as much as I can. Um, and to that end, I would want to be able to confirm that it's the same entity. And the, the canonical case for me is the, is the employer. I do not want my traffic being offloaded outside my employer's network without uh, some more manual configuration occurring. And so I think it might make sense to have resolver identified be split into two, uh, resolver identified same entity and resolver identified generic. So that a client that does not care can take either, but a client that does care can verify it is same entity if they want to, without regard as to saying which a client should be doing or which is better. Um, just providing two different technical mechanisms so that the discerning client can do their thing, the general case client can do their thing. Thank you, Tommy. Andrew? Hi, yeah. Um, I just wanted to uh, just capture the point, again, which has been discussed on, on Jabba by some of us. Um, I, I fundamentally disagree with, with the position that uh if uh, if if the client if the user is is, is using dhcp and and and, and uh, to, to determine the dns that, that that for some reason uh should be maybe set aside um because they're wrong um we, we shouldn't try and second guess uh the user um uh, in in that instance um that you know it may be that they're content that in for, for their setup um the dhcp and dns is sufficiently uh, uh locally protected um so consequently um I, I think it's entirely valid to to go with that and to try and second guess that and and go down an alternate path with it without their agreement it just seems to me fundamentally wrong and flawed um uh, and, and also 
yeah, I think we need to bear in mind that this this isn't specifically uh, or or purely just for going from um, uh, the DNS over 53 to to dough. This is going from any flavor of DNS to any flavor of DNS uh, as, as a discovery uh, mechanism uh, is is my understanding. Um, so we need to bear in that uh, bear that in mind as well. But I think the key thing is uh, we we can't second guess. The, the the user we should go for equivalent with uh with what their current settings are um and if they've or, or what their current choices are and if they've used dhcp to get to those choices then that's fine um and don't see an issue with that and i don't understand why other people would thanks thank you andrew Niman, please oh now it worked Fascinating stuff. Um, so uh, I, I I think I would just like to continue that thread because that brings me to the conclusion that uh, uh, that what we should look at here is not trying to tell the client that that <clears throat> this other resolver is equivalent uh, because uh, resolver A cannot tell the resolver that B is equivalent because the, the, the decision to accept and the decision to make the, 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 uh, the, the claim or make the statement that two things are equivalent sits with the client. So the only thing we can do is for A to tell the client, for resolver A to tell the client that here is an alternative resolver uh, and go and ask it about its properties and make up your mind whether you would like to trust it or not. Uh, so we we really only need to care about uh, suggesting alternative resolvers and whether they are equivalent or not is a second transaction that the client undertakes after having been informed about the existence of an alternative resolver and by talking to the alternative resolver because that's the only way you can build a bilateral uh, understanding of whether you want to trust someone or not. Uh, I don't trust people because one person says you can trust this other guy. I'm sorry, that's not how I work. I, I would go to the other guy and then I would build a relationship with that guy and say, okay, he seems trustworthy, I will trust you. Uh, but that's a second transaction. But I can take a suggestion from the first guy to say that I, I find this guy to be trustworthy. Why don't you talk to him? So make this first step very simple. Provide alternatives to, to uh, resolvers and then build into the concept that there is a handshake uh, in some way, could be very lightweight, <clears throat> where the client uh, discovers or the properties of the, the alternative resolver and builds, uh, it comes, comes to a conclusion whether it wants to trust it or not. Thank you. Thank you. Ralph, please. Um, so to, to answer, mm -hmm. Andrew, there might be a misunderstanding. My understanding of the earlier argument of the margin was that there, there are cases already where you don't trust the HTTP, like when you have a policy, uh, on your, uh, a policy from your enterprise on your laptop that you only can trust certain DNS servers and, and things like that. And I think that is what what was described and I think this is what has to, I mean, there's, I don't think anybody disagrees that the enterprise can set policies on devices for the, for their users. However, in the absence, and I think that's what, we're, what we were talking about, in the absence of those policies, uh, there should be what I think Lehman said, a designation suggestion from the, um, uh, from sort of the resolver that the client should follow. Thank you, Ralph. So we've actually, oh, Ted. Uh, so I just wanted to follow up on, on Lehman's point because I don't think it's practical for us to follow it quite as exactly as he laid it out. Because what I heard him saying was it, it, it actually just provides a C also and makes no assertion about the characteristics of the of the um, the entity or the the resolver at the at the place you're you're going to see, but suggests you go and probe it uh, to see whether it's to your liking. And I think that that probing is going to be very error prone. And the split DNS thing again is an example of this. If I uh, am talking to somebody 
uh, inside my, my enterprise and I get a C also from them. And I, I don't know just because of the, of the fact that it's within my enterprise and therefore within my split DNS, that they wouldn't designate somebody that didn't have access to the same pool of names. But I have to work out for myself whether they have access to the same pool of names. It's, it's quite problematic to do that. I mean, I can design new mechanisms by, by probing and checking long-lived caches, and I can, I, I, can, I can figure out a way around the problem, but it seems to me much harder to, to develop as a, uh, as, a, as a piece of information than simply saying, okay, I, I went there for, for reasons uh, like DHCP assignment or RE assignment, and they have given me this other one that they are willing to say is from their perspective has access to the same pool of names. Um, that level, I think, is important for us to, to, to try not to just throw out and say, it, it's just a random collection of other resolvers they know about. It has to, there have to be some properties of those other resolvers uh, that they're willing to, to, to make a claim about, um, even if that's not a claim that, that we can um, uh, have some confidence about through on the wire checking. We, we have to have something to, to kind of say that these are related and what that relationship is. Thank you, Ted. Daniel, please. Um, going back to um, um, Ecker's example with Firefox, that is proposing a list of uh, resolvers and let the client choose which, uh, which resolvers you want to configure um, is broader. Um, I, I think it's, a, it's an important use case because um, Firefox is not managing, is managing none of those resolvers. It's just providing a list and let the client choose. And so um, if he's proposing A and B as a, two different resolvers, it's basically Firefox as a, third party saying, I assume A and B are equivalent, but um, none of, I mean, A will not be able, or is not likely to say I am equivalent to B, and B is not likely to say that it is equivalent to A. Um, so this somehow shows that the word um, equivalent in that uh, sense might be uh, a little bit misleading. And um, yeah, because we don't have these reflections between the 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 the, the, the proposed resolvers, um, but the the other thing is also that uh, Firefox is not um, uh, operating one of those resolvers, so uh, it's a little bit different than the use case we started with, uh, where the resolver was run by the ISP. And so um, I, I think. Um, what should be considered is a way to express the list of resolvers that we are uh, that one entity is recommending, and um, and, and then um, we need to be able to discover which entity we want to be to to ask for a list of recommended resolvers. Um, in the case of um, when we are using a, a web browser. Um, this entity is, well, this web browser, so it's an application, and we ask, I mean, the, the company um, providing that application. In the case of an ISP, we would like to ask the ISP, um, the ISP um, that is uh, usually providing the DO53, we basically want to ask him and to discover who should we ask that represents that ISP. And so it might be uh, good to differentiate the different, um, it's one thing, one, one thing is the list and the people operating each of, of the member of that list and the, the entity providing that list. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Lehman, please. Muted. Too many mute buttons. There you are. I'd like to respond to Ted. Uh, so uh, I, what I took away from you, what you said is that that you wandered into policy space twice in different directions. 
uh, one is that it it I don't see that the the, the resolver can declare equivalence because uh, it's how should I phrase it? We can we cannot we cannot forbid the resolver to lie. And since we don't really know whether it's lying or not, uh, what the information it gives to the client is, I wouldn't say irrelevant, but cannot be taken more seriously than a hint. Uh, <clears throat> now, it could be that the, uh, the the second thing is that whom I trust as a client uh, is up to me as a client. And I can have uh, a wide selection of policies. One, I can select a policy from a wide set. And one of them is to believe whatever I'm told, which is fine in in, most, in many conditions. So we 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 can. I, I'm perfectly willing to accept the situation where the the resolver A says resolver B is is an alternative server. Uh, uh, please use that instead. And the client says, okay, I'm happy with that, uh, and that's okay. It's a policy set by the client that says, accept whatever you hear. Uh, but I also want to be for, for, for the client to, to be able to make its own decision. Uh, we, we cannot enforce that the server, the, sorry, the resolver, we cannot mandate the resolver to tell the truth. And because of that fact, uh, the decision what to trust must sit with the client. And it can do whatever it likes to verify or not do whatever it likes to verify uh, the situation. So ha having the, the, the resolver say, yeah, please go here and have, have the client follow suit, say, yeah, that's fine. Uh, that is a perfectly good situation. But it's actually down to policy, specifically in the client end and to some degree in the, in the server end, what they say. And what we should focus here is on the mechanisms where this information is conveyed between the, the resolver and the client or between the RA or the ACP server and the client so that we can hand, hand the information that the client can use to make an informed decision according to its policy. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Ted Hardy, please. Uh, Ted Hardy speaking. Uh, thanks, uh, Lajo. That, that was uh, uh, a nice explanation of, of your, your position. And I think there's a good bit to agree with there. I think where I don't necessarily agree is on, on what that mechanism's limits are. Uh, you talked about the hint portion of it. And whether we call it a designation or a hint, or I, I kind of become a bond, we'll call it a pro tip, right? <clears throat> if the EDNS zero pro tip contains uh, a, a, a different resolver name and uh, DOT or DOH designator, then uh, the, the message you're getting back is you can go over there and this um, resolver believes that resolver has access to the same names. If that's what that means, then it's just a hint, right? You may have to go and confirm it for yourself. You may choose to accept it. You may say, I'm not willing to accept it. As you say, that's entirely up to your client policy. But the semantics of what that pro tip means has to be um, pretty clear. And whether it means those people are going to give you um, uh, DOT or DOH transport, and I know nothing else or whether it means those people are going to give you a DOT or DOH, DOH transport, and I believe that they are um, going to have access to the same names, maybe because I'm the same service, right, and I, I operate both, or whether it means I believe that they uh, have uh, a recommendable set of practices because I'm actually going to give you one that I'm pulling from the, the Firefox DRR. Uh, those are different potential hints. And I think we have to be clear either that we're going to pick one and say that's what it is, or we have to have some way in the protocol mechanism of telling you what the hint means. Because if it's just uh, there, there's also this other entity out there, and I have no information about it other than I'm going to tell you what its IP address is, then it's it, this we can stop. This is not useful. Thank you, Ted. Ecker. So this discussion is making me, reminding me why I don't like requirements documents. Um, because it seems to me we are spending a lot of time arguing about um, uh, uh, stuff that I'm not sure actually affects the protocol particularly. Um, so I'd like to suggest something different, which is 
um, the person requiring documentation for the protocol. We have a protocol proposal um, in the form of DIR. Um, now, I am not like a fan of every single bit of the protocol, but I think it's generally in the right, in the right direction. So I would suggest that we put this document on the shelf and we discuss whether we should adopt DIR and what people think would DIR be need in order to be acceptable and then um, um, and, and go from there and not so much worry about this requirement document. That was my proposal. Thank you, Ecker. Welcome back, Lehman. Well, thank you. Again, a response to Ted uh, in, a, in a positive tone. Uh, I, I think you, you uh, hit something there. Uh, I, I think the, the, the mechanisms uh, should include uh, the intended meaning of the, the information. I think you're spot on there. The semantics part that you talked about is is quite right, and and uh, I, with, with that, I'm I'm I, I'm willing to how shall I phrase it uh, adjust my stance a bit. So it's it sounds like a good idea to have the resolver or the the party that conveys the information uh, signal somehow that I. I, I am trying to convey this type of information to you. I'm trying to, to, to convey a, a message with the following content to you. Uh, and, and that is an important thing. Uh, so it's how it's received is still a policy matter with the client, but having additional information that, that uh, where the, the sending party can convey the, the, the notion that I'm I'm trying to tell you that I believe that this other resolver is equivalent to me. Uh, th that is meaningful information. And uh, I uh, thank you, Ted, for reminding me of that. Thank you. Thank you. Puneet, please. Hi. So I agree uh, with uh, Ecker to the point that we should look at the protocol and there's certain things we'll not be able to specify in the protocol. So one suggestion is maybe in the requirements talk, we actually explicitly list, list the things which we will be unable to do, right? Uh, like how much can you trust the network? That's basically the, I think the fundamental issue here, how much can you trust the information you're learning from the network, right? Uh, thank you, Pini. Uh, Tiru is actually in, in the queue without being visibly in the queue. So, Tiru, please. Hey, thanks for that. Uh, Mike, I agree with Ikara that uh, it, it seems like the working group has mostly agreed to using uh, network identifier and resolver identified as two protocols for uh, identifying encrypted resolvers. And we should go with that and then figure out a way to prove equivalence or identifying cryptographically whether the alternate resolver is the best resolver uh, that an attacker may not be possible to host and then uh, whether the client can pick that up. But that seems to be an alternate uh, whole lot of uh, different mechanism irrespective of whether network identified or resolver identified or picked because both can be susceptible to on-path attackers and uh, uh, there needs to be some proof for the client either with regard to trusted resolvers or some assertion from the alternate resolver proving that uh, it's being hosted by a legitimate entity and that I think should be taken as a separate uh, requirements or discussion at the working group but I think from a protocol perspective picking those two alternate uh, uh, of uh, network identifier and resolver identifier would probably be a way forward where we figure out this larger topic of uh, uh, identi how identifying how the client can make sure it's talking to an uh, uh, resolver indeed provided by the network and not by an attacker. Thank you, Tiru. Tommy? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Very good. Yeah, so um, just as, as an author of the dear work, just so we can comment on what Ecker was saying, um, I, I think based on this discussion, I, I agree that you know really we are doing a lot of bike shedding and wordsmithing on how we need to view these things and communicate about these mechanisms. But it doesn't seem like we have a lot of disagreement on what the discovery mechanism needs to do. Um, so if the group 
finds it acceptable, I think it would make sense to kind of progress on unblocking adoption of some mechanisms and actually working on those as a group and continue to keep those mechanisms up to date with whatever language and bike shedding we have on these definitions of whatever we're going to call it, equivalence, um, designation, anything else. And I would also posit that it would be probably more productive at this point to have us, some people go away and make concrete textual proposals um, for terminology and descriptions in the forms of pull requests or in the forms of email so that people have time to really, you know, write a very precise language around this. Um, and then for myself, I would actually be very interested in hearing kind of practically in the rest of this session, when we look at not how we talk about it, but what the actual mechanisms are doing, such as the mechanism in Deer, are there concerns or problems or things that people think will not satisfy some of their basic use cases. And I think that would give us more uh, food for progress going forward out of this meeting. Thank you, Tommy. Andrew, please. Hi. Um, uh, yeah, again, just, just looking at the uh, chat, uh, I think some people have asserted that um, as long as it's the same entity, that's sufficient. Um, um, so I just wanted to, 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 to capture the, the point that actually for the use case that originally prompted this discussion, if we can uh, remember that far back uh, to uh, uh, this morning, um, uh, actually it does matter that it's both the same entity and the same answers as far as you're, you're able to ascertain. Because for example, um, some uh, resolver operators uh, provide a range of different resolvers with uh, with the, the the provide different answers um i'll pick on cloudflare as it's the first one that sp springs to mind um where it has uh, some with no filtering some with different types of filtering so uh, i think for equivalence um it matters it's both the same entity and and sh ought to be the same answers um clearly for things like designation um wouldn't have the same requirements and that's completely fine but for the use case that we started with um the, the, the chris had equivalence uh, as a consideration um i think both elements uh, are, are important i just wanted to capture that um, but uh, whilst i'm speaking i don't have a problem with what tommy said either in terms of the need to progress on other stuff um uh, uh, as well i think that, that matters too thanks Thank you, Andrew. I will note that at the moment the queue is empty and I kind of feel like, uh, well, like it's 1.30 in the morning and that people <laughs> now have a lot to digest on this conversation. We, we really haven't come to any conclusions, but hopefully we all understand each other a whole bit better now. And I'm gonna toss it back to Glenn to uh, continue with the agenda. Ready? <laughs> Well, we're into the uh, the last sort of big push here. We have uh, 37 minutes left in session, so that's awesome. Um, so do people have the energy left in them to go on to the next discussion, which was uh, going back to the, the slide here on preview. The next discussion was to have a quick discussion about the proposals people put out about putting IP addresses in certificates. Uh, in particular, it seems, based upon what I've seen on list and from some of the uh, Git discussions for some of the drafts, that some people have a concern over whether this is a, uh, a possible thing to do uh, in that some um, certificate issuing services may not uh, be providing certificates with IP addresses in them or support that as a feature. And, and there was some really chat going back to the very beginning on here um, on this particular topic from Ecker and a few other people. So if you guys would like to sort of jump in the queue here and share, is this is this a practical thing that's going to work? Is this something we should not do? Is this something we should do? Is this not something you can be worried about? And I'll turn it over to my co-chair at this point. I, as I've seen, I've stirred up enough people to get them in the queue. 
So we're turning it over to Ecker now. So please go on, Ecker. Channeling what I strongly suspect Martin Thompson is about to say, as he said it in the chat earlier, the facts are pretty simple. You can get IP address certificates. There are C issues in them, but some crypto does not happen to at this moment. So sorry, I heard that you said that. Um, I didn't quite get what you just said there. Could you say it again? A I said more? IP address certificates exist. You can get their CAs. Their web PKI valid CAs which issue them, but some crypto is not one of those CAs. To the best of my knowledge. Okay. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Ecker. Martin. Yeah, so the other piece of this is that they're, they're very widely supported in clients and uh, you will be able to connect to a server that has an IP address certificate fairly reliably in most stacks. So all, all the browsers and things like curl and whatnot all, all generally support IP address sense. Thank you, Martin. Kira, please. Yeah, we've been talking to Let's Encrypt for providing us certificates for hosting uh, that on the router. And as as for my information goes, they don't provide any IP address based certificates so far. Thank you, Tiru. John? Yeah, um, I, I was just going to say, and a concern I have here is that while it's probably easy to get an IP address certificate for a server that you, where you control the server and the IP space, that is not necessarily true for uh, people providing uh, either recursive or authoritative recursive DNS as a service or um, uh, any sort of uh, application, you know, service provider, something like that. I, I have some concerns around that. Um, it's possible they're misplaced, but I think uh, I think that's going to be challenging uh, for for some folks. Thank you, Tommy. Um, just to comment on some of, some of the uses for the IP address certs. I, I certainly recognize that you know some of the cases that people have brought up are challenging to get IP address based certs with. Um, however, just like um, what Martin was mentioning earlier about you know, clients will evaluate for themselves whether or not they want to trust the um, resolvers that they have discovered. That they, he mentioned there that you know a mechanism to do that is to check that resolver against a TRR list. Um, our stack currently does not have any list of hard-coded resolvers that we trust. However, if you know, one potential way of saying, looking at things is to say, if you do have an IP address that you do control that is stable, like what we see for quad one, quad eight, other servers, that that could be an indication that a client stack could use to say, okay, this is good enough for me to trust this if you're, if, even if you're sending me to a different address. So I, I think it, is a high bar, but it can still be a useful bar for things that don't want to bake in knowledge of TRR or things like that. Thank you, Tommy. Martin. So the, I, I think I, I had hoped Tommy would touch on this, but I wanted to make this very clear. If you have a policy of accepting whatever the network gives you, then this is not a relevant question, uh, even in the context of the DEER draft. The reason that you would use an IP SAN in the context of DIA specifically is that you have discovered a server and you already have some expectation that um, the server either has to be the same for whatever that means, or you know an identity for that server based on the IP address. So you, you've had a, a, a user actually go into the machine and say 9.9.9.9 and you want to respect that choice. And at that point, you probably do care about having an IP SAN. And for, for those cases where someone has directly configured something in the client, then it makes sense to have that manifest in an, in an IP um, that you can, uh, you can authenticate by the certificate. Um, and that's even true for cases where you're using 1918 addresses, for instance. Um, but it does require that you have uh, for additional steps because obviously you can't get an IP certificate for an, for an IP address that other people can also use. 
Thank you, Martin. Ben, please. Just responding to Martin, um, my reading of Deer specifically is that it essentially, uh, rather than trying to distinguish between the the provenance, uh, distinguish the provenance of the DO53 IP in order to determine whether it was received over some sort of secured or unsecured channel, it simply assumes that it might have been delivered over a secure channel. And so it applies these these checks unconditionally. Uh, uh, even though right. in some I'm, cases, I'm not sure that that's, it's overkill. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that that's that's necessarily the right posture to be having, but it certainly does have that posture. Yes, I, I should have qualified my statement. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, we have reached the end of the queue, and I think that we're kind of winding down on energy here. Um, Glenn, would you like to bring it into our planning for an interim discussion? Did I unmute myself successfully? You did. Wow. I, 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 and, and it's been a long week, so my, my ability to mute and unmute is disappearing. That's pretty bad. Um, so, OK. The next topic, uh, and, and then we'll let everybody go, um, is uh, jump to it. Um, looking ahead, uh, ITIF 110 is scheduled for March. Uh, we seem to be making progress both on lists. There's been a lot of good activity and it's been a fantastic discussion uh, this last week here. Uh, it takes that momentum up. We have the holidays, of course, coming up uh, for a great many people. So it would seem that late January, early February would be a, an appropriate time to have an interim. So just a sort of a a quick poll, and shall we do that? Should we try to use the hands tool? This one, how do you do that one? Maybe it's, I'm too tired to actually figure out how to use a new tool right now. <laughs> Sorry, um, just generally, uh, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm gonna put it up. Um, should we have a uh, an intern? I'll, I'll put up the, the, the hands tool here. Uh, February. There we go. And everyone can sort of poke at this thing, this new fancy tool we have, um, and decide, you know, you know, give what you think uh, about this, should we do it or not. And then for those of us who are in the, uh, the, the dark time zone at the moment, we can all go to sleep. <laughs> or go to our next session. <laughs> I've got a session plan, so it's unduly up. I'm going to sleep because I have a session. I have a session here that starts up at three o'clock, so in the morning. So I'm going to try and grab a couple hours between now and then. All right. So we're, we're look, we're we're getting a, a pretty good turnout. Twenty nine people so far have said yes uh, that we should have a, a thing. So that seems like a. I'm going to call and say we probably will have an interim. Well, some two two people put their hand down. It's going up and going down. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, it looked like a hundred people were in the queue. So, uh, <laughs> Andrew, if you actually intend to be in the queue right now, let me uh, go ahead and speak. Uh, yes, I, I, that, that was indeed uh, intentional. I just wanted to say, well, two things. Firstly, uh, on the presumption that there's something worthwhile discussing when we get there, clearly, um, having an interim seems like a good idea. I'd go so far as to suggest maybe um, even considering provisionally looking at two dates because uh, that seemed to work quite well um, for the last sort of virtual interims um, with, with a, maybe a gap of a week in, in between them. Again, on the assumption that progress has been made and there's substantive content to uh, discuss. But I think it would be valuable to do something prior to uh, 110. Thank you, Andrew. So noted. Any other comments? Well, if you have cookies, where you are, feel free to go eat them. <laughs> and with that, uh, thank you so much for joining us here at the uh, on Friday or Thursday, wherever you're at. Um, and that's the end of ITF ADD uh, for one of right. us. Also, thank you to our note takers for the heroic job you do. Um, lots of fantastic notes in there, and we really do appreciate the effort. 
So thank you so much. Bye all.